Hello, my name is Laura Victoria Ward, and I am very excited to be here today with Ofra Wolf. Uh, I'm in Kingston, New York, and Ofra is in New Newburgh. So um, just a quick background. In quarantine, the thing that I've been doing the most is glitter size, which is sort of free dancing to hydrate the tissue in your body, to move, to play, and to feel good, to elevate the spirit. So for me, a big part of that is getting dressed up in a ridiculous costume, um, and putting on a bunch of makeup and that starts me feeling good and then I dance to the music of either my boyfriend or my friends and and invite people to come and dance with me which I've been doing first on Instagram and then on Facebook live um, but my background is in movement analysis and continuum and ballet and all sorts of theater dance theater so it's sort of a short version of sharing that with other people and inviting them to move to get up off their butts and in this time, I have seen Oprah also do some pretty cool stuff. So go ahead, Oprah, let, let the people know. Who are you? Wow, that was such a great, succinct introduction. Um, I will try. So my name is Ofra Wolf, and um, I'm in Newburgh, New York, not too far from Laura, down the river. And um, I, you know, I, I my, the, the core, the heart of my work is really improvisation. I've also done a lot of um, Laban and all kinds of somatic um, movement um, techniques to go deeper into my body, but um, I'm an improviser, I'm a contact improviser, and um, I run a move, um, an event here in Newburgh, or I have for the past four years, called Newburgh Open Movement, where I would normally invite people into a shared space um, where we can just play together for um, about three hours, usually with live music, the musicians are really paying attention and following the room so that you feel like there's some kind of response to what you're doing. Um, and I've really been searching for how to get that response and that sense of collaboration and um, how we notice the way that patterns are emerging in the moment and respond to them. So I'm here to play with Laura and find out what we can do. Yeah, and before, before we turned on the record button, um, Ofer was just about to tell me about the story of leaving the city, right? Closing your studio. Mm, yeah. yeah. Um, well, I, you know, I'll, I'll make it short. And um, we, we had um, bought a place up here in Newburgh and I thought that what I would be doing is what you're doing, Laura, which is going back and forth. I had a, a little work live space in the in Brooklyn that um, you know I had a beautiful little studio that was doing really well. I thought I'd hold on to that, and um, I when I came up here, um, I I decided to take a month off around the holidays, and my body just collapsed. I felt really exhausted. The exhaustion was just you know, like nothing I'd ever experienced. And my partner got really worried about me. And uh, my heartbeat is irregular, which is maybe why I um, like to move in irregular ways to, uh, to meet my heartbeat. And um, he asked that I go to see a cardiologist. Um, I didn't have insurance at the time here at the States. And um, I was going to visit family in Israel where there's a socialist healthcare system, and you know, I, I could I could find my way to a cardiologist, um, and I did, and I was misdiagnosed, terribly misdiagnosed. I was told that I was um, on my deathbed, and that I um, I had a congenital heart condition, which meant that I could um, die at any moment. Um, and so when I came back, it was clear to me that I needed to make some changes and that the commute back and forth to the city and that, you know, all the movement that was going on in my life had to, um, change in some way. And it really sent me on a journey of, um, questioning what it meant to be healthy. Um, because so much of what I had been doing had been for the purpose of health and, it took about three months, maybe, maybe a little less, two and a half months to find out that I had been terribly misdiagnosed. I have what's sometimes called athlete's arrhythmia. Um, my heart rate is extremely slow. I can move for hours and hours without breaking into a sweat. Um, and it's most likely that I'm going to be just fine. Uh, but in those couple of months of contemplating life and death, um, I really, you know, a lot of 
structures started to fall apart for me and I found it very difficult afterwards to feel motivated to teach any kind of traditional um, exercise or fitness class because it brought up a lot of questions for me about what it means to be fit as a human being. And um, yeah, it, I think it drove me a lot deeper. It took some time, it wasn't easy, but into my creativity and trusting my intuition. And really, I think my biggest exploration has been around time and timing. And that's why improvisation is so fascinating to me um, because I think it can really, um, transform our relationship to time, which I believe is one of the things that's making us sick in our culture right now. And one of the gifts of the quarantine is that it's forcing us all into this moment in which we have to question our relationship to time and how we use it. That's the short story. <laughs> that's <laughs> perfect. That's great. Um, so we want to have this, uh, this shared space session of us hanging out together uh, involve some actual movement and some play. Uh, two of our favorite things. And I just totally resonate with you on that idea about what a body should be like and the sort of cultural overlay that, well, I'm going to say it, white body supremacy has on everyone. And, and that white body supremacy means that the ideal body is the fit little tiny girl body, like looks like a ballerina and um, has no extra anywhere. And if we, we can agree that if we can agree that that's the general idea that is put forward in most, most advertising and in most, um, most imaging, Hollywood, it's all there, all that idea of what this perfect body is. And it, anyway, I don't need to go into a huge waffle about that, about that. But I feel like when we start to allow our bodies to have some space and not be tight and rigid, and that's one reason why I started getting into continuum, finding fluidity and finding novelty as opposed to banging in the same rigid patterning. So having said that, uh, I like to balance the light and the dark. <laughs> it's not all happy puppies and rainbows. There's a little bit of darkness and shadow involved. So let's, um, let's start to move. So Oprah is going to, we're going to do three little sections of movement, or that's what we plan. But of course, everything is always subject to change. Um, and I'm going to keep trying to rearrange my camera so that you can see my body or I can see my body. And I'm going to watch and listen to Ofra. Um, all right. Well, the, you know, the way that I usually um, like to start warming myself up when the easiest way for me to start warming myself up is, um, I don't know if this is actually an exercise or, or a concept that I picked up from Steve Paxton. And it's the idea of sharpening our bones. So getting right into our bony body and um, the face, since we're going to be playing with a face is a really fun place to start. What I find really useful is if I take a moment and just kind of ground my feet and um, I'll warm up my hands so that I can, you know, really start to feel um, my hands and also the bones of my hands a little bit because they're going to be making contact and that I just have some, some sense of connection to my, to my center, even as I move around my body. So I'm warming my hands up right at my center. And then I'll, I'll take them up and I'll, I'll start to find the bones of my face, like the cheekbones or the jaw bones. And I'm just, I'm sharpening. It's like almost as if I would be sharpening a knife. And so for example, with the cheekbones, after I sharpen a little bit, I might take that sharp bone and just slice the space a little bit with it. Yeah. And then I'm always checking to see, I'll come back to the face. Like if I notice I'm not breathing a lot, I'll sharpen up the sides of my nose, get some air in and my forehead so that it has space to go up. And then I can take that really sharp nose and I can use the, the nose to slice. I'll probably start making funny faces because I feel like I need to stretch my nose, yeah. And I can start to switch a little bit from the cheekbone to the nose to the other cheekbone. Yeah. 
Other bones that I really like to uh, sharpen, I'm already getting warm, that's good news, um, are, um, so um, my, my clavicles. And I'm, you know, I'm just kind of looking for the bone. And actually, since we're in the arms, this is the sharpening that um, Steve taught us. So it's from the edge of the pinky finger along the arm and back into the shoulder. And you can feel this uh, bony edge of the arm. Let me do both arms. And then this is really a nice, a nice slicer of the space. And then, I gotta say, I feel the wonder of it. Like, I feel like as soon as I started watching you slicing the space, I, was, I start to feel like, oh, the wonder of it, of the yeah. moving. <laughs> and then, you know, if we, if we try the clavicles, these are, so the, the inner bones are a little trickier, but there is a sense of like, I can cut the air with it. Right, and I can start to, uh, you know, kind of carve my own space in unexpected ways based on what the bone allows. And then I might go back to um, like a previous one, I might just feel my arm coming in and wanting to slice. This one's really, I think, quite intuitive because you can cut almost like a sight. And the cheekbones. There's um these are fun too sometimes is the um the well ASIS technically, the tops of the hips. And you can really feel like that bony ridge right there. Yeah. And then you can use that to slice. So you've you've sharpened into it. And now you can use that sharpness to uh, move around. You want to propose a bone to sharpen? Me? Yeah. Yeah, let's go with the um, tibialis anterior, this front of the shin. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, so as a ballet dancer, mine is really overbuilt. Yeah. <laughs> All that pointing and flexing. So like getting the, creating some space right next to the bone. If I've sharpened the bone and then feel the relationship of the bone to the fascia and the muscle. Yeah, this one's good. Yeah. And I feel like that sort of mid limb stuff, which happened with sharpening the arm, but also with the tibialis anterior. Uh huh. Is the, or it's, a, it's the tibia, the tibia bone. But I thought I went into muscle and tissue. I'm a fascia person. But like that mid limb stuff, it really fits in the space of my small room. Like, uh huh. Well, your elbow, knee. Oh, I'm always amazed at how much you can do in your small room, by the way. <laughs> like, is the room really that small? Or? Actually, like, I'm like, my, it's about six feet across. Wow. Yeah, I know. But then there's more room here. Like I can go back. It's probably about eight foot forward and backward. Okay. So, and, and not a very high ceiling either. <laughs> anyway. Okay. Take it back. Take it away. Maybe more leg bones. Yeah. How about the, how about the tops of the feet a little bit? Sharpening. I like the sharpening image. I like the whetstone idea, the hand as a yeah. whetstone. I think it also is, is really useful for um, helping take the movement very quickly out of the muscles. Yes. So it's not so much about making an effort in the muscles to make a shape, right. but really feeling how the bones cut through space. And the bones are so grounding. Yeah. Right? Bones are our connection to earth and our density, which are still, I've been taking all these classes with Liz Cook, and she was talking yesterday about the lightness of the bones 
but they're they're like these little they're all full of liquid and fluid but when we start to be able to move into them there's a sense of lightness as well well anytime we have a sense of strength there must be somewhere a sense of lightness yeah and you know the kind of airy structure when you look at the bones like all the all yeah. the air inside i'm thinking maybe we can try the back of our body so maybe the scapula yes. um which we can't reach too well but a little bit and especially that point of the scapula we can get a nice sharpie point of the scapula oh yeah oh yeah that one can really uh oh and then it just leads into all this rib cage freedom yeah And suddenly it's like the bateau ivre, the drunken boat is crashing around here. I don't know, it's funny, I didn't expect my shoulder blades to do that today. To take uh -huh. to like this moment like of really free flow of freedom. But thinking, especially thinking just from that base of the scapula, that base point. Yeah, the, that tip. Yeah. It can almost... You can almost impale the space with it. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, I feel like there's a there's a song where Flaca Andres Calamaro where he talks about the shoulders and like the sharpness of the shoulders being like knives. Uh-huh. I feel like I mistranslated the song and somehow it was more knifey than, than what he intended. You know, as you're talking, I'm watching you for a second and I'm immediately noticing your fingers, which are oh, yeah. quite sharp to begin with, but we can sharpen the bones of our fingers and really um, then play a little bit with the way that these sharp little bones can... Oh, I like that. that... Yeah. So there's a, an exercise, it's a Qigong exercise, but I feel like in this kind of space of coming, of Zoom, it's an exercise in almost all the Zoom rooms I've done, and I've done it in my class, and it's like the monkey presenting the plate of fruit uh -huh. to her friends, <laughs> and accepting it too. Oh, like, nice. Yeah, like, oh yeah, accept your, what is that plate of fruit that we all want right now? What's in that plate of fruit? Some human touch? <laughs> Yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, yeah, spending time with another person in a body in the same room. Yeah. How about the outside edge of the foot? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Even slicing through the floor with that outside edge. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, of course, since we're at home, like it's free game, you can yeah. use the walls. And this is where I feel like there's a little bit of possibility for a sense of contact. Yeah. And, you know, and then of course it's, you know, kind of fun to try to break your brain and see if you can keep it all sharp at once. Your cheekbones, your shoulder blades, your whole arm. Oh yeah. Your shins, your feet, your fingers. Oh yeah, super fun. Yeah. And also like it's a total different embodiment than my normal embodiment, right? Thinking from this place. What do you think is um what do you think is different in the initiation than the normal for you? Um I think like because because of just even the language of sharpness, I'm really thinking about edges and joints as well, like yeah, and slicing like 
that this this isn't carving and slicing like carving and slicing is really three-dimensional like yeah and, and there's none of these other rules about how the body has to be right it's like oh get in there yeah <laughs> in whatever way yeah. and it's freed up so much of my of my torso and spine in a different way than my normal you know the normal thinking of my body mind is different in this and i love the bones yeah like that well as you're talking it you know it's making me realize that for me i find this really useful precisely for that reason that it um helps me connect to the three-dimensional space that i'm in it, it makes me feel more um in the space and of the space yeah. because i can relate to it in this way of slicing it in all kinds of different ways yeah and slicing it with different body parts, right? Yeah. Slicing can happen from deep inside or from really surface areas. All right, shall we bring this one into a close and go into yes. stage two? Stage two. <laughs> stage two. Welcome to my madness. And you know, the other thing that you uh, mentioned that I just, that kind of got me going is that it's so interesting to hear how you're uh, responding to it. And I feel that um, it's reminding me, you know, that this, this work of sharpening is part of, um, is part of Paxton's um, material for the spine. And, you know, the spine is kind of like, it's very hard to feel that bo bony structure. It's kind of, it's deep inside. And so there's all these ways that of, you know, how can we, access it how can we access that movement without trying to go directly there how can yeah. we get into the skeleton and other ways that open up mm -hmm. and just thinking i mean that brings the idea like i feel like again it's our language the idea of a column which is like a rigid structure but liz coke and she's not the only one but talking about the spine as being a river where that fluid the fluid the nervous system and the cerebral spinal fluid is all coming through the inside of that mm. bathing the brain bathing the nervous mm. system so there's a real sense of fluidity in there mm. and and our alignment is constantly dynamic right it's constantly in adjustment so the way like just to have watching you when you were talking about the spine like how much movement was going on yeah so the creating a new paradigm for what a spine is and does i feel like that's Part of, and, and a big part of my interest in having these kind of conversations so that we can talk about language that's more supportive and nurturing for an, our animal, hu, you know, human animal bodies mm -hmm. and, and ways of being in it. All right. Well, I, you just keep me going. I'll say one more little thing. Keep talking. Little, we could probably even do this and have a conversation. And have a conversation. Um, but, you know, just that, I, like, one of the things that, um, you know, has, has been really helpful to me um, is, is the idea that, you know, often ballet and certain dance techniques, they really impose images on the body. Like, imagine yourself as A. And, and so this really turns it around and says, use your imagination to feel your body, to feel your bones, to feel something that's really there and, and how it might relate to the space. And just that little switch was so helpful to me at a certain moment in my development as a dancer. I had such a hard time with these images that I had to impose on myself and I felt like I, I didn't get it. Yeah, yeah, it's funny because I was actually studying lava analysis, lava movement analysis and doing ballet and doing really a lot of like intensive private lessons with Sarah Nice. Studying, I, I got into movement analysis because of Jackie Villamil. And, and, but the, the, the methodology there presence of being in a body was very different than the external structure. Um, and, and I still battle with it, you know, like, cause I still, I do like to dance to music with a group of other people, but the ideas, the sort of inherent, you know, royalty driven patriarchy, that's what ballet yes. is. That's what mm -hmm. a big conservative, which any kind of classical ballet company is a conservative company. There isn't another way. So contemporary ballet kind of breaks those bounds. And, and I've always been a contemporary ballet dancer. But I feel like part of the conversation about this movement is that people cannot see what they haven't seen before. Mm -hmm. So you can go out there and start showing something and it might as well not be happening because mm -hmm. if people don't have a frame of reference for that type of movement, they don't see what you're doing. They see something, whatever it, it, it connects. Somebody, Jack Anderson, 
wrote of a piece of mine, a piece that we were throwing ourselves on the floor and getting up and throwing ourselves down, his response, and he was, you know, an older man at that time, for the New York Times, Laura's dancers did a little more than waft across the stage. I was like, what? What dance was he at? We were <laughs> throwing ourselves on the ground and getting back up. Like, we were violently activated in that piece. So, I mean, so he couldn't see it at all. And I feel like with our, we have a very conservative American dance funding is usually going to big, very visible companies, right. mm -hmm. that, you know, are imposing no threat uh, to people's thinking, right? And I feel like through the body is where it all changes because the body is where we're storing it all. So let's uh, start breaking that up with our fun play. So this is going to be <laughs> non-contact improv putting on some makeup because mm. it seems to be one of the things that most people are interested in. In, um, in, in my glitter size, it's like, how long did it take you? I literally do it as fast as I possibly can. So, you know, I think I'm just gonna go with, oh, where is it? There it is. These two things. This wow. is a powdered uh, eyeshadow and this is another powdered eyeshadow in a roll-on form. And I have, whoop, I, this makeup has taken a fall so many times. This one, oops, which, as I drop parts of it onto my computer. I'm sure that's healthy for my, uh, my computer. Here I have one of these, I have this, but I'm gonna stick with the blue colors, the blues and the greens, because that seems to be my, my theme of late. And you can go any color, well. Well, I'm, I'm gonna take inspiration from like my orange, reddish orange, and there's just a little twinge of green in my, uh, in that feather. Yeah, yeah. I was out in the forest and I saw the most incredible red birds, scarlet tanagers, which are just passing through right now. And I've just, all I've wanted to do since then is wear red, so. I, I totally get that. Um, yeah, so. All right. Here we go. How is it done? Maybe we stop talking and we just watch each other and like, Call and response it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's also really funny to look at people putting on makeup. <laughs> So anyone watching this at home, I want you to feel free to go raid the makeup bin. Oh, yes. And get, some, get something on your face. Please participate. Participation is one of the keys to having fun in life. There are no rules. You can't go wrong here. Can't, unless you ruin someone else's makeup. Yeah. <laughs> take a risk. Take a risk. And it's worth it. You know, I, I, love, I love that you actually brought in the idea of contact improvisation into this, Laura, because that's really what I feel like I'm doing with my body. I'm, I'm not going so much um, for image at first as for feel, like where do I want to feel the draw of the brush on my body? Oh, that's cool. Okay, I got I to gotta add some other things because I see that. Oh, the chin. <laughs> I love yeah. the chin. Some tools. Uh, and I watched um, the Met Opera version of um, The Tempest, mm. a fantastic, a fantastic production. 
but that was on yesterday. The makeup was amazing. Mm. Wow. Yeah, you don't even need a mirror. All you need is Zoom to put on your makeup. Yeah. I think I'm getting somewhere. Looks like you got a, you got a lot of places there. Hmm. My camera, my campaign, my camera's like, what do I focus on? Yeah. I cannot focus on a face like that. I, I'm actually really intimidated by makeup. I've never been someone who really wears it. It took me actually until my um, 30s to even start wearing lipstick. And I have this story in my head that I'm, I'm really not good at it and that's why I don't do it. Um, and this little kit that I bought has just been <sighs> therapy. You know, it's funny because I feel like um, with my dancers and with my dance company, usually like I'm like, okay, put on a ton of makeup and they'll put on a little bit and they're like, oh, have I done too much? I'm like, no, you need like a thousand times more, like total maximalism. Wow, look at you. One big yeah. crazy eyebrow here. And yeah, this may, it's a little different when we do this in the mirror, but I've, I've gone for a little asymmetry while Hofer has got a pretty symmetrical thing going on there. Oh, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I like that look a little bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, playing with makeup and overdoing makeup is, is really fun. Although sometimes you feel weird if you go out like that. Like, oh, yeah. Although Anthony and I both are often will wear kind of weird makeup. Um, and uh, people usually like it. Oh, I like that. <laughs> Shall we try? Are we ready? Yeah. Do you think you've done enough there? Oh yeah, I need one little, a little more green. Yeah, I don't know. I got, I got a. You, you've, you got, you got a whole thing. But I'm, you know, I got, I got to stick with this plan that I got going on here. Okay. Just fill that in a little bit more. Go, Oprah. Go, Oprah. Go, Ofra. Put the makeup on. Got the makeup. Looking good. <laughs> All right. All right. Let's see. Now I've got better light. Wow. The mistakes I made and the rightnesses. I feel like if we just put like one big band of shadow across our eyes, pretty much a la Blade Runner. That would solve a lot of makeup problems. Yeah. Like, all we need is one big band across, and it doesn't matter if you did it right or wrong. There is no right or wrong. So, so me and Oprah are going to share this, this dancing moment with any kind of inspirations that come in. Um, and my interest is actually to dance with. So to find something where we can share our... Um, <laughs> we can share our movement where we shift back and forth to there is no actual planned lead and follow but there is a sense of some lead and follow happening which has suddenly changed time speaking of which uh-huh and an interesting thing you can dance with a person and be totally dancing with them but do something completely different doesn't have to be the same so if you're watching this i invite you to participate do something. Get up off your butt or don't, but move your arms. Play with us. Yeah, so a lot of times for me, music is my inspiration, but it can just as easily be another person. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.
blocks. So how do you feel different, Oprah? What does it feel like for you? You know, it just, it just gives me so much permission to feel the creature in me. Where we started with like the opposite of this very socialized body. Like all the ways in which my body wants to be unsocialized, you know, animal-like. And as soon as I have a little bit of weird paint on my face, I just feel like that's what I should be doing. You know, I felt that wind all the way into my room from your room. <laughs> That's awesome. I'm sure I did. I have had those kind of experiences too, moving with people in, in the Zoom where you feel the, the thing. <laughs> and you're like, oh yeah, I'll, I'll take that. <sighs> yeah, how do we share, this is a really interesting question for me, like, how do we share impulse? in these very like distinct far away spaces and the different ways of matching right i can match your effort i can match your time but be to totally in a different sense of space So often we think of choreography really as just being body parts moving in space, not the, the other side. Right. Or shapes, you know, like a series of one shape followed by another. It also brings up the question, how long is it okay to stay connected, right? How long, how long can, I, can I manage my connection with Ofra before I start to feel weird, right? It's just, that's a social thing, right? I mean, like, we're probably some of the most permissive people you can move with. But even <laughs> within this, like, sometimes, and sometimes it's just a body answer. The body just says, do it now, because that's the time. Well, and that's the time that I'm interested in. Those yeah. experiences of like, you know, I'm just doing it. Right. Because that's just the time to do it. Yeah. And, and that's one of the reasons why I've, I've been so thrilled with, with what you're doing with your glitter size online, because the timing is just so right. <laughs> it's you the time right. to do it. Well, the funny thing is with glitter size, like we have been trying, the idea of it happened a long time ago in a rehearsal where I was running around screaming, glitter size me. Cause I think one of my dancers was like, oh, you're glitter sized. And, and then we were like, this is actually a good idea. Something that in involves joy and play and sparkles. Like what could be wrong with that? So it's only actually, we've been talking and writing back and forth about it, but we haven't actually done anything until now. Yeah, how do we find our playmates while we're in quarantine? That's why I like, Suggested we get together for this. Oh, yeah. You need the experts. <laughs> really, little children are the experts in how to play. So yes, all they my are. That have kids just make me so happy when, they're, when they are in any of the rooms I'm in. Oh, well, we're almost coming to an hour. So. <sighs> What do you think? Anything, any final words? Anything to say, even as we're moving? Um, yeah, I think, you know, 
you said you said the the magic word which is permission you know and uh that's what that's what i feel like we can share with one another you know and um sometimes it's hard to find it for ourselves and uh you know, if this, if this offers anything to anyone out there, it's just the permission to, to play, to get weird, to find out what your body wants to do, you know? Yeah, a friend of mine who, um, his name is Michael Taft, he's a, he's, a, he's a meditation person, and he's somebody that I grew up with, like one of my, I was 15, my most advanced playmates learning how to play and have fun and make art. It was Michael Taft. And two things. One is he used to talk about my nose being a razor sharp beak. So wow. as soon as that nose sharpening, the nose came in with my mm -hmm. two bones, I was all there for that. But we were just talking the other day and he does a Vipassana. He's a Shenzhen young person, does Vipassana uh, meditation. So it's all based on body sensation. But he said that at one point while he was, and he's been very, very involved in that for years. He's written books about it and whatnot. At any rate, he was saying, like, there was a certain point in his meditations where he realized that his body had a language, that it wasn't the verbal language. Huh. It wasn't a language that was coming from the outside, but there was this internal language. So I haven't, he, he wrote some stuff about that, which he's supposed to send to me. I haven't read it yet because I haven't gotten it yet. But just what is your body's internal language what is your body's imperfect story yeah and where can you give yourself permission and that's actually for the glitter size like the thing that's been the most inspiring is hearing other people say well if you're doing that maybe i can do the thing that i've always wanted to do uh -huh. like, what, what's better than that right so like for us to share whatever kind of gifts we have with the world, our little monkey plate of fruit. Monkey offers the plate of fruit. <sighs> monkey accepts the plate of fruit. Mm. <laughs> yeah. I feel really hugged and held by you right now, so thank you. Oh, From thank one you. monkey to another. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I feel like that was so fun and just exactly what I was hoping for. Yay. I, I want to mention, if it's okay, that um, I'm doing uh, this Saturday uh, my second ever online open movement. So we're keeping it kind of small because I, I do want people to stay feeling safe to really experiment and check. And um, I'm interested in as many people who don't consider themselves dancers coming on board and playing around. We, we won't cover our face and makeup this time. <laughs> Although I feel like that might be coming. <laughs> um, but that's, that's a little offering that I'd love to put out there. Um, yeah. Use this. Things. Yeah. Um, I, I don't, we, well, we have a chat. Do you want to just write it in the chat and then I can pull the link later. And when I post this, I can put it underneath in the links. Right, will that be an ongoing class? It's, we're going to do it. Well, every, every two weeks, um, at least for the next couple months. And the thing, the thing about it that's a little different um, is that we do have live musicians. It took a couple months into this quarantine to figure out how to make Zoom work that way. Um, how did you make it work? What, are you in different rooms or in the same? No, room? Yeah, we're in different rooms. Yeah. And uh, you got to ask the, you got to ask the musicians, the and Reinhardt in particular, who sat and figured out the technical details. Um, but I find that that also really helps to connect us as people is that you know the musicians are watching us and responding um and it kind of keeps you on your toes you know so relationship music yeah. dance that's it right vital communities used to be held together by moving together and music together like hmm. which is one of the big sad things of this this time where we can't move in the same spaces or play be in our musical spaces mm -hmm. so re-pioneering new new levels with that so that's on saturday is that three what time is that it's it's free it's from five to six it's just like this one short hour just get yourself into it and moving and um you know there's something that i'm that i'm called to say and just to take it back to what you were talking about in the beginning because i feel like you know sometimes um 
you know, this idea of having to decolonize our bodies can feel really like, ah, uh, you know, and, and I really connected it with what you said again at the end, which is not that you have to um, be less of something, but find out how to be more of your own body. You know, find out to be more of your own rhythm, of your own yeah. impulses. We're very removed sometimes from our own impulses. And that's what the colonization is, is that distance between you and your impulse, the distance between you and your desire. And so here we are in this world where we're all kind of get to be in our own closed room. What a gift, you know, that's a really safe space to start exploring your own personal impulses. Yeah, that's exactly it. And, and we don't want to erase the things. I still dance ballet, but I also have to do continuum. Like I'm a maximalist, I want it all. I don't want to have limits. I want to be able to do the ones that, yes, it's exactly like this and it has to be like that. I want access to that, but then I need to have access to the, it's total freedom and listen to your body, listen to what your body wants. Mm. Yeah, and what feels good and what is nourishing. Yeah, precision can really be a portal to great freedom and practices that help us to cultivate precision. It's not about the precision itself. It's about what it, what it teaches us and what it opens up for us. I feel like that's been my experience. So okay. yeah. Yeah, that's great. All right. So we have got exactly 20 seconds left until this hour, this time is over. So I'm going to just stop recording and then you and I can talk. So thank okay. you anybody who's made it through yes. an entire hour of thank us. <laughs> <For you. sighs> <laughs> yeah, my, 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 my camera is having such a hard time today because I'm making too many faces. All right, recording. Thank you. Mm.